Well, I looked it up. Uh, I've talked about this parable a lot on various occasions, not just on Sunday morning, but various occasions, uh, by my count, eight times in the last two years. So if you've heard me talk about this parable before, uh, you might have one of two responses there. Number one is, would you stop talking about this parable? We've heard it enough, thank you. And the other might be, make up your mind what it's about. Because you seem to be contradicting yourself all the time. And my response to that would be, one, no, I'm going to keep talking about this parable. It's a great story. Why wouldn't you? And two, I like to think I'm trying to be more like Jesus, um, who is very definitely not an either-or kind of person and is more of an and-with kind of person. In other words, it's okay to have different views of a story like this, especially when it speaks to you in different ways and different occasions. Because remember, like we've, I don't know, how many weeks now with parables? Seven weeks we've been talking about parables? And all along I've tried to say that there's two brilliant things about parables. One is when Jesus tells one of these stories, I think it's invariably because he wants to illustrate a point he's trying to make. In other words, that surface obvious interpretation of the parable, that's probably why Jesus was using it. He's trying to make a point. It's like this, he would say, and then tell a story. The other thing that's so brilliant about parables, though, is there's not just one interpretation. In fact, I think, I think even though we, we usually only hear, well, in, in each of the Gospels, we only hear Jesus tell one of these parables once, I think he probably told them lots of times. And not just to make the same point. I think he might have used some of the parables to make different points at different times, because you can. That's what's so brilliant about them. When you start to look more closely at them and go a little bit deeper... There's more to them. And so I think Jesus would have used them to make a different point on different occasions because you can. That's what's so great about them. And this is a really great example of that. It's a really great example of that. Now, we traditionally are very certain that we know what this parable is about. Because I stopped before the part where Jesus explains it. I just read the parable. Just the story. But as you are probably aware, because you might have heard me say this, I don't know, eight times, um, the story doesn't end there. It begins with Jesus sees the crowd and he goes to tell them stuff. He's teaching. And as Jesus is wont to do, he teaches with parables. He tells these stories. Here's one. It's a parable of the sower. It's the parable of the sower. You might also know it as the parable of the soil or the parable of the seed or the way I like to tell it, it's the parable of the sower, the seed, and the terrain on which it lands because it's about all of those things. Except, as Jesus goes on to say, according to the gospel, one of the disciples says, why do you keep teaching in parables, Jesus? And Jesus says, because. Well, it's like this. You guys, you've been with me for a while now. Uh, we've been hanging out together. You've seen what I've been doing. You've been living with me. You get that I'm trying to live God's love into the world. You're, you're part of that now. Personally, I think that's super optimistic of Jesus to think they get it already. But still, you guys get it. But there's going to be people who don't. There's going to be people, first of all, who don't get it because they just don't get it. Like, they'll, they'll hear the first three things I have to say and then go, yeah, whatever, and move on. There's going to be people who are going to hear what I have to say and they're going to love it. And they're going to really buy into it. But after a while, they get really tired of it because, you know, it can be challenging. And they'll get bored with it and they'll move on to something else. And there's going to be people who are so entangled in the life that they live in this world, 
in, in so connected to the, the things, the stuff that they want and, and, and money and all of those things that it's going to be a real struggle for them to try and live what I'm teaching. And eventually they're going to just have to give up because they're going to just want stuff instead. But you guys, you guys get it. So I need you to, to be able to teach other people and show other people. And in fact, you're going to have to show other people who are going to have to show other people. Because you get it. But you have to be aware that some people don't. And that's, that's how people are. And so here's what you might do with that. And by the way, that's exactly how to interpret the story I just told. Some of the seed lands uh, on the path where it's picked up and taken away right away. Some of it lands on rocky ground where it doesn't get much purchase, but it, and it eventually it like jumps up, but it doesn't last long. Some lands in thorny ground amongst the weeds, and then there's some that lands in good soil. And here's what we do with that. We go, you want to be good soil. That's the end of it. That's what the parable's about. You want to be good soil. Right? All, I don't know, 30 of you in this building that seats 240. So it's your job now to go out and talk to all of those people that fall into those other categories I was just talking about and make sure that they understand. Off you go. No one's moving. That tends to be how we tell this story. You want to be the good soil, and if you're not, well, sorry. You know where you're going. But is that really what Jesus meant? First of all, first of all, I quite honestly challenge the idea that this parable was followed by Jesus talking about why he tells parables, followed by an interpretation of the parable. First of all, because I, I don't see Jesus interpreting his parables anywhere else, and the only reason he seems to be doing it right here is to make the point that he was just saying about why he teaches in parables, which is perfectly valid. It's a perfectly valid interpretation. It's not the only one, it's the thing. And sometimes we can fall into that trap of, yes it is, and all the others are wrong, which might as well put you in the category of somebody who believes they're good soil and all of the other parts of the earth are wrong. They're not. God's there too. It's about how we relate to each other, isn't it? And so, really, the point Jesus is trying to make, if indeed he explained this parable and why he teaches in parable, parables, is that people are different and we need to remember that and instead of maybe telling them they're wrong about something, maybe we could understand why they think what they think or share the what we think in a, in a positive way that might help them. I don't know. That sounds good to me. But I seriously wonder whether this conversation actually even happened. So I wonder if the gospel writers kind of thought, hmm, Jesus tells a lot of stories. There must be a reason. I think it's this. I think that Jesus tells a lot of stories because he's trying to illustrate the point he's trying to make and he wants you to understand. But I also think that Jesus tells parables the way he tells parables because he wants you to think. He doesn't want you to just hear, this is what it means so now you know, he wants you to engage the story and go, well, I wonder. And I bet Jesus would say, if you understand this story in different ways, and those ways are good, and those ways are life-giving, they're encouraging, they're inspiring, they're supportive, and they are about good. They're about love and grace. Good for you. You got the point, which is always Love. It's always love. 
So, that's a really good interpretation of the parable. It's perfectly valid. It's also important to remember that if you're going to understand the parable that way, that God is still in all of those other places where there is uh, barren ground or it's rocky or uh, the weeds are there because that's how our lives are. Our lives are never just always green pastures. Yes, that was a reference to Psalm 23. And if you think about the 23rd Psalm, what it's about is God being present at all times, wherever we are in our life. So maybe that's a little bit about what this parable's about too, that we might remember that our lives aren't always just good soil. It's also worth remembering too that maybe this story isn't just about us being the terrain. Maybe, maybe it's about us being the seed. Maybe we're the seed, and that's, that's how we need to re- why we need to remember that the, the ground can be different. How do we get through that? If our lives are, indeed, uh, like being in the wilderness or, or rocky, or like we just feel overwhelmed with things, how do we get through that? How would we find our way to the good soil? Maybe it's by remembering that God is there. And God is love. And love will bring us through those things. And particularly if we are, particularly if we can help someone by remembering that everyone's ground is different. There's no right place to be other than where you are. But what if, what if you're the sower? What if this story is about you being the sower? Any farmers immediately are going to go, no, because you wouldn't waste seed that way, would you? No, you'd find the perfect place to grow it. You'd fertilize the ground. You'd till the ground. You'd do all of that stuff. I know I did that in the wrong order probably, but still, I'm not a farmer. Uh, But you would do something to encourage the growth and find the best soil in which to do it. And you certainly wouldn't waste the seed because it's expensive. But what if the seed is love? What if the seed is God's love, which goes everywhere? Because God's love isn't about where it lands. It's about the giving of it, because it goes everywhere. That's, it always strikes me as interesting when people start talking, and we do this in church all the time, don't we? We talk about unconditional love. No such thing. There is love, which is, by its very nature, unconditional. Anytime you put conditions on it, it's not love. It's something else. It's not love. Love is about what we offer. That's that's God's love. We offer it to all. Even, Even if it lands on the path, it can make a difference. The birds were fed. Even if it lands on rocky ground, something grew up there. And maybe, just maybe, enough grew up there that it created a little bit of a little bit of something that allowed something else to grow there. A little pocket of dirt, compost, whatever. I'm not a farmer. Something that allows something else to grow there. And what is a weed anyway? Seems to me we first of all, arbitrarily decide what's a weed, which is the thing that we don't want to be there when we're trying to grow something else. But we also, we make salads with weeds. Come on. We do. Even weeds have a use, is my point. Whether you think they're a weed or not, God's love isn't conditional on where it lands. And our love shouldn't be either. Jesus' love for others certainly wasn't. There are so many ways into this story and so many different perspectives that we can have on this story. So many, even even if we just say, you know what? You could be the sower in the story. You could be the seed. you You could be the ground. Sure. 
But even amongst those three different ways of looking at it, there are different things that we can learn. But they all come back to the one thing that's at the heart of the story, that's always at the heart of the story for Jesus, love. One of the most beautiful things about this parable is that the love is everywhere. The sower is so loving that the sower casts the seed everywhere. Wherever the seed goes, it does something that is good. And God is present in all of the earth, in all of creation, in each of us. Love is at the heart of this story.